Hello, my name is Barb Farrell. I'm a pharmacist in the Briere Continuing Care Geriatric Day Hospital and one of the leads of the Deprescribing Guidelines Program of Research at the Briere Research Institute in Ottawa. Our research team has developed several evidence-based guidelines for deprescribing. Deprescribing refers to the planned and supervised process of dose reduction or stopping of medication that may be causing harm or no longer be providing benefit. Each guideline includes a two-page algorithm to help make decisions about when to reduce or stop a medication and how to do so safely while managing other symptoms that may arise. This video shows how to use the proton pump inhibitor deprescribing algorithm. Also called PPI, this is a class of drugs that reduce stomach acidity and are often used to treat severe heartburn or stomach ulcers. The algorithm has a front side with the step-by-step -step process for deprescribing and a backside with more information to help with the process. Our first case is Derek, a 67-year-old man looking to decrease overall pill burden. His PPI was started by his primary care provider four years ago to treat heartburn. Starting at the top of the algorithm, we ask ourselves, why is Derek taking the PPI? We know it was started to treat heartburn, which he now describes as having been mild and usually relieved with over-the-counter antacid. Since starting the PPI, he's had no symptoms, and when asked, he says he did not have any investigations involving having a tube down his throat. Based on this description and the fact that he doesn't appear to have had an endoscopy, he may have just had occasional heartburn or mild to moderate esophagitis, but not likely gastroesophageal reflux disease. Once he'd been asymptomatic for a few days, he likely could have stopped the PPI. To make sure that he doesn't have a reason for continuing PPI use, it's important to check that he doesn't have a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, isn't taking a non anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen or naproxen, doesn't have severe esophagitis, and has no documented history of a bleeding ulcer. Based on his medical chart information and his own recollection, Derek does not appear to have had a peptic ulcer, has never been diagnosed with H. pylori, and has never been admitted to an ICU. All of these conditions have specific treatment durations, and Derek has been taking his PPI for much longer. Thus, Derek is a good candidate for deprescribing of his PPI. The notes on the back side of the algorithm stress the importance of a conversation about deprescribing to explain the rationale. For instance, the possible side effects of PPI use and that long-term therapy may not be necessary, as well as the process for deprescribing. These recommendations are informed by interviews with patients about facilitators for deprescribing. Because there is no evidence that one tapering approach is better than another, we choose what is most convenient and acceptable to Derek. He says he's comfortable with stopping the PPI and using it on demand. This means that if his heartburn symptoms return and can't be relieved with over-the-counter antacids, he'll take his PPI daily until his symptoms go away, repeating the process if needed in the future. We'll monitor at 4 and 12 weeks to check if Derek has heartburn, regurgitation, dyspepsia, or epigastric pain. We can have him visit the clinic, call him, or just ask him to let us know if his symptoms return. We'll recommend non-drug approaches such as avoiding meals two to three hours before bedtime, elevating the head of his bed, losing weight if needed, and avoiding dietary triggers. Occasional symptoms can be managed by using over-the-counter antacids such as Tums, Gaviscon, Pepsid, or even over-the-counter PPIs that can be used on demand. Months later, after using over-the-counter antacids to manage rebound heartburn and avoiding dietary triggers, Derek is happy to be feeling well and taking one less medication. Our next case is Carol, an 89-year-old woman living in long-term care. Because of her previous stroke, it's hard for her to communicate verbally. Her medication review was unable to determine the original indication for PPI, but she's been taking it for many years. Because we're unsure about why she's taking the PPI, we asked Carol's family about whether she's ever had a bleeding ulcer, used medications for pain and inflammation, ever had heartburn, reflux, or stomach pains, and if she ever had a scope down her throat to look at her esophagus and stomach. The family has no idea, but they can't recall a hospital admission for bleeding ulcer, so that helps us decide it's likely safe to try deprescribing her PPI. 
We talk to Carol and her family about the rationale and process for deprescribing, then choose a tapering option acceptable to them and to the care home staff. The team feels more comfortable reducing the dose first, especially since the original reason for it is still unknown. The dosage sizes available in Canada are listed on the back side of the algorithm. Monitoring for heartburn or reflux in a person who has difficulty communicating can be hard. Long-term care physicians and staff recommend that staff monitor and report changes in appetite, weight loss, and agitation as possible indicators that the patient might be having heartburn or reflux. They can also report obvious reflux or signs of stomach upset or pain at any time. And the pharmacist and prescriber check in at four weeks to determine if the dosage reduction has been successful. If no problems have arisen, the PPI can be stopped with the same monitoring continuing. Meanwhile, non-drug approaches to managing heartburn and reflux can continue, for example using bed supports to elevate the head of the bed and avoiding meals just before bedtime. If Carol has no symptoms, she may do well without her PPI. If it appears as though symptoms are returning despite efforts to manage heartburn without using drugs, she may benefit from testing and treatment of H. pylori, or if that's not available in her long-term care home, she may need to return to the low-dose daily PPI. Our last case is Darlene, a 53-year-old woman who is asking about cheaper alternatives because she has no drug coverage with her part-time job. Darlene said she's been taking the PPI for two years. It was started by a specialist after she had a scope that showed mild esophagitis. Because of the frequency with which she'd been having heartburn and reflux, the doctor told her she had something called gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. After she started the drug, her heartburn stopped completely. To her, it is a miracle drug. You confirm with her that she has not had a bleeding ulcer, isn't taking non anti-inflammatory drugs chronically, and has not been told she has Barrett's esophagus or severe esophagitis. After two years of treatment with no symptoms, Darlene is a good candidate for deprescribing. Like our previous patients, we need to talk to her about deprescribing, explaining the rationale and the process. However, when we mention the option of tapering off the PPI, Darlene says she tried to stop at cold turkey once before, but her symptoms returned. She's hesitant to stop and instead asks for cheaper alternatives. It's likely that Darlene had rebound heartburn when she tried to stop such a high-dose cold turkey. Reducing the dose to once daily for a few days or weeks may help. Engaging Darlene about ways to manage rebound heartburn is critical. We've also prepared a handout that you can share with patients to help them with the process. This could go a few different ways for Darlene. She might manage well with dose reduction to once daily, then to the lowest dose possible for a week or two before stopping. But she may have frequent heartburn and reflux again when she stops the PPI. Testing for H. pylori would be valuable to see if she needs treatment, and if that's negative, and if she's unable to manage heartburn with other approaches, she may need to return to low-dose PPI use on demand. Or she may be able to manage rebound heartburn easily with over-the-counter medications and lifestyle changes such as reducing caffeine and avoiding other dietary triggers, eventually stopping her PPI and using it only on demand. I hope you found these examples helpful to understand how to use the PPI deprescribing algorithm to make decisions about when and how to reduce PPI use. The goal of deprescribing is to reduce medication burden and harm while maintaining or improving quality of life should always be done with planning and supervision by a healthcare professional to make sure it's appropriate and safe. The Deprescribing Guidelines project was initially funded by the Government of Ontario through the Ontario Pharmacy Research Collaboration, with recent funding through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'd like to thank our team of investigators and staff, as well as all those who contributed to developing and reviewing each of the Deprescribing Guidelines and algorithms included in this important initiative.